Exploring the Mind, Adversity, Resilience, and the Developing Brain, in partnership with the U of M Department of Psychology. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, this is a study we've been working on for a good five years now, and we hope to keep chugging along and doing it. This is a, it's a big uh, longitudinal sample of, at this point, adolescents, but as you might know, they grow up and become adults, and uh, we, we hope uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we hope to uh, continue uh, to follow them, and I hope you'll, as we go along, you'll realize why we think it's uh, so important to um, uh, keep following this, uh, this sample. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand. I, I actually like questions during, the whole, uh, dur during this whole thing. It makes it less formal and more fun, so feel free if, it, if something's not clear, Feel free to raise your hand. I'm, I'm happy to, to do my best to answer your question. Okay. Okay, so let me give you a, a, big, a quick background on what I'll be talking about over the next, uh, say, 40 minutes or so. Um, so I want to uh, first uh, talk about broadly uh, about adversity and all the negative outcomes that come from that, specifically negative child, childhood adversities that kids might experience, such as growing up in poverty, experience neglect, things like that, and the host of bad outcomes uh, that may come from that. And then I'm going to talk about this sample uh, that we've been following. We actually piggybacked onto this. It was this existing uh, sample that we discovered, uh, we learned about, um, f again, five, six years ago. And it's called the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. So I'll give you some details on that. And then I'll uh, talk, I'll give you some brain basics so you understand when I show you a picture of the brain and show you some area of activation, my hope is that'll actually mean something to you after uh, this uh, brain basics uh, tutorial. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I'll give a theoretical model based on all this, uh, uh, how we understand or how we hypothesize specific types of environments that kids uh, kids are growing up in, how that may impact uh, brain development, and in turn, how that may increase the risk for uh, various forms of psychopathology. And then I'll give our results from this um, study. I'm going to talk about some of the family characteristics, both uh, good and bad, uh, that we found in, the, in this sample, which may be uh, some of the most interesting data uh, of, of tonight's talk. And then I'm going to um, talk about uh, our brain imaging findings as well. And then based on those data, I'll wrap it up and give you a more uh, specified model uh, that I think more, based on the data, more accurately describes how certain kinds of environments may impact the brain, both good and bad ways, and how that might relate to uh, risk for psychopathology. But before I even get into that, I want to give you the take-home message uh, up front and early in case I uh, run out of time or get tired. <laughs> I want to give it to you while we're all, while we're all alert. Uh, so the take-home message for me that I hope to impart is that the brain is infinitely malleable. And so the environment has the capacity to actually change the brain. So the brain is not static. The brain is not destiny. The environment can affect it both in uh, good and bad ways. And so this whole idea of, of, the, of the environment altering the brain, that idea is called neuroplasticity. And so I'll be talking about some negative environments and how that impacts the brain. I really don't want you to be left with the idea that I'm thinking, oh, the, the brain is broken. It's that the brain is responding to the environment and the hope is someday we'll be able to create environments or alter the environments in such a way and harness, you know, I'm jumping ahead of myself, harness this uh, neuroplasticity in positive ways to help these kids reach their, their best outcome possible. Okay, and to that end, we'll provide some suggestive evidence um, of how positive environments might help uh, these kids at risk be able to, to do as well as possible. Okay. Okay, so on to the background. So um, there's a whole host of different kinds of adversity that are known to go on to lead to negative outcomes. So there are these big 
They're epide called epidemiological studies where you get these huge samples of, say, the United States. You follow kids, see how they do later on in adulthood. And so it's well documented and it's intuitive to all of us that if you grow up with a lot of, lot of challenges, your outcomes may be compromised to some degree or other. So examples of of adversity is uh, growing up in poverty, uh, where there are few resources available to the child, uh, living in a neighborhood where you have a lot of, uh, where you're exposed to a lot of violence, uh, living with a family where you're experiencing a lot of neglect, or you're even worse, experiencing a lot of abuse. So those are examples of adversity. For outcomes, I'm talking about uh, having a lot of uh, growing up and developing an anxiety disorder, growing up and having a depressive uh, disorder, having ADHD, and so my focus is on my focus is on uh, mental health issues, but also it can be beyond uh, mental health and with school performance, job performance, all those things as well. Okay, so what is less clear? though, is first of all has to do with specificity. And actually, let me just drop back here. So we really don't know very much about how specific types of environments, such as growing up in a household where your parents are really not involved in the child's life, not getting much positive interaction with the parents, does that specific kind of environment, does that, say, lead to a greater risk for depression, or does it relate to all these kinds of outcomes equally? We really don't know. So specificity is one area where we really don't understand much about these kinds of environments and their outcomes. The other area where we really know very little has to do with the brain, and this brings us back to neuroplasticity, and how does adversity actually get under the skin and alter brain development? What is that mechanism um, that leads this environment to be able to alter the biology, alter, alter brain development, and then reduce the likelihood that the child will be able to succeed later on? Okay, so to that end, to try to begin to answer these questions, we teamed up with this existing study. Again, it's called the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study. And so this is a study of children born around the turn of the century. It's a national study. Uh, it involves 20 uh, US cities and around uh, started out with about 5,000 kids. It's a good-sized study. And what they did, as I'm a developmental psychologist by training, uh, along with getting a lot of training in neuroscience. And so what's really exciting to me, and what I, one of the many reasons why I love this study is that they've looked at these kids at birth, so zero, and then again when the child was one, three, five, nine, and then most recently they came back to look at these, all these kids nationally at 15. So there's this host of really rich data about the child's environment, the neighborhood environment, how the parents are doing, how the parent uh, is parenting the child, and how the child is doing, all the way from zero. Okay, so we found out about this study <laughs> about six years ago, and we're fortunate enough to get uh, funding to be able to uh, piggyback onto this existing study. So we call our study, and in retrospect, not the best name because it's not gonna be appropriate in a little while, uh, the study of adolescent neurodevelopment, I guess we could say study of adult neurodevelopment pretty soon. And we looked at the, more, the most uh, local kids to us. I know it's probably hard to see, but uh, you can see the mitten here. So we looked at, we're lucky that there are two cities, two fragile family cities that are close to us. One is Detroit, and the other right there is Toledo. And then we need to get some more subjects, so we then branched out to Chicago and got 34 uh, additional subjects there. So we recruited, we were able to successfully recruit uh, 237 of these adolescents and brought them here to, uh, to the University of Michigan for the Chicago families. They spent uh, actually two nights here because the, the trip took a while and there's a lot, a lot involved in, um, in the data collection and interviewing the families and so on. And so we did uh, MRI. We did uh, funct something called functional MRI, excuse me, and another thing called uh, diffusion MRI, and I'm going to define that in just a little bit, but just know that they lied in the scanner. Many of you, I'm sure I've received an MRI. They did something very similar to that. We also assessed mental health 
of the moms and also the teenagers. And so we were able to get, they filled out questions telling us about symptoms that they felt, they felt anxiety, they felt depression, but also we had a full evaluation where we were able to do a diagnosis if they had a depressive disorder, if they had an anxiety disorder, things, things of that nature. And then we also assessed adversity ourselves. Um, we, most, many of the cases, we went to the home and assessed the home, assessed the neighborhood. But a lot of the data I'll be showing you is from the Fragile Families da uh, data collection, where they went in at ages three, five, and nine and, um, and measured the, uh, the environment as well. OK, great. OK, so this is our study, the uh, SAND study. Or, um, yeah, okay, so I got through all those slides. So let me, so as I was saying here, there are two main types of MRI data collection or brain imaging data collection that we used. Uh, one is functional MRI and the other is diffusion MRI. And so let me uh, give you a little background on each of these and hopefully understand why I think it's, it's interesting and exciting. So the first one is, uh, fun and there are other measures too, but I'm going to focus on just two. Functional MRI is where it allows you to look at blood flow. And so blood flow um, provides oxygen to active nerves. So you give a subject a task, say in this case, the subject is doing an attention task. And so areas, there are areas of the brain that are active when they're doing an attention task. And so the idea here is with fMRI is that you're looking at specific regions of the brain that are perhaps involved or necessary for doing that task. The other measure that we use is called diffusion MRI, and that is where you look at white matter. You, you're able, with diffusion MRI, you're able to measure something called white matter. And so what's white matter? White matter are nerve fibers that are covered in this fatty sheath that allows rapid communication between different areas of the brain. So really, if we can measure white matter, we're looking at how the brain is wired up. And so it, the understanding now is that the brain isn't just, you don't have these islands of activation and that's it. The brain is this complex network. And so by looking at the white matter, we get an idea how the brain is wired and connected. And if we use it in combination with functional MRI, we can see what areas are involved in a task and then how those, and then by using diffusion MRI, how those areas may be interacting with one another. So let me talk a little bit about, uh, about the brain and how it relates to uh, to the environment and psychopathology. I'm first going to talk about some fMRI data. So uh, I want to focus on one of my favorite structures called the amygdala. It's this structure that's very deep inside the brain. It's a subcortical uh, structure that all mammals have. Um, and it's involved, and it's very responsive to any kind of salient or important stimulus uh, that we or rats uh, see in the environment. So if you see some kind of threatening stimulus, your amygdala activates very quickly. Um, it's also involved in detecting and recognizing emotional faces. Any kind of face is automatically a pretty salient, important stimulus for us to know. And so the amygdala is, is responsive to all sorts of emotional faces, in particular uh, threatening faces. Okay, and so also looking at the environment, uh, if you grow up in a household with uh, maltreatment, there have been uh, studies uh, showing, and this graduate student of mine, Tyler Hine, did this, it's called a meta-analysis, it's a study of study, excuse me, study of studies, where you look at all these different studies and put it together into one big analysis, and she found that if you grow up with a lot of maltreatment, you're going to have greater activation of the amygdala later on in life. And then bringing in psychopathology, uh, we know that kids, both kids and adults with anxiety disorders show greater activation uh, to threatening stimuli relative to, uh, to healthy controls. Okay, so lying in the MRI, granted, a very artificial environment, um, having them look at different kinds of stimuli, such as threatening stimuli or not threatening stimuli, kids with anxiety disorders will have greater amygdala activation in that artificial environment. 
So is is the amygdala response linked to one of those? I think it's even before one of those like fight or flight responses or possum or all those th options. I think it's even before that is the way I conceive of it. It's a you can, and there have been studies that have been done looking at even before you're aware of the stimulus that the amygdala may be active then. So it's just a first response before you make any kind of um, on any kind of decision. It's just it allows you to you know if you you know if you're walking through the woods and you jump because you see a snake, you're you're not aware of that. You're not aware of that snake. It's just the first uh, gut response. And so that's how the we think of the amygdala. How does this amygdala activation relate to emotional intelligence? And I wish I could say, oh yeah, the more activation you have, the more higher your emotional intelligence. But it's really not clear cut. And there are people with like who have lesions in the amygdala, and they're still able to recognize faces. And it is it's a complicated, messy literature. But it might. It, it could, there could potentially be a role for the amygdala and emotional intelligence, but it's certainly not clear cut, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so let me move on. So this is uh, amygdala and anxiety and threatening stimuli. So let me talk about another area of the brain. It's also another deep structure called the nucleus accumbens, and it's right uh, here these deep structures right here. And so the nucleus accumbens is a structure, this deep structure that's very responsive to what the term is rewarding stimuli, such as if you give subjects when they're in the MRI, or even you can do this with monkeys, you give them some kind of gambling task and they happen to win, or monkeys get a bunch of raisins, that the nucleus accumbens is very active in response to that. In addition to to reward like that, it's also responsive to intrinsic rewards um, such as happy faces. So happy faces are intrinsically very pleasing uh, to see. That's why uh, Facebook and Instagram are so highly used. It's, and so those stimuli too activate, strongly activate the nucleus accumbens or related to activation of the nucleus accumbens. And then also, uh, teens, and this is a relatively recent study, teens who have suffered neglect growing up, so again, looking at the role of the environment, they have reduced activation to the nucleus accumbens when you're having them uh, do a gambling task. And then bringing in the, dep the uh, psychopathology piece, um, depressed individuals uh, show less activation to happy faces. They also show less activation to, uh, to monetary rewards in a gambling task as well. And that intuitively makes sense. If stimuli are rewarding, individuals with depression just don't experience that reward to the same degree that a healthy individual does. So now these are looking at structures in isolation using uh, functional MRI. And now I want to go and talk about uh, diffusion MRI and what uh, we can do, and so this is work done by uh, Lee Gotches, looking at how, looking at white matter and how then these, how specific structures of the brain uh, connect to one another. So she, Lee, looked at the amygdala, the con white matter connections between the amygdala and this structure called the prefrontal cortex, and that's this whole area right here. There, and what she found is there are a lot of connections between the amygdala and all these different areas of the, of the prefrontal cortex. But one of the strongest areas with the greatest connectivity or greatest white matter connections was this structure here that's depicted in yellow. Um, it's called the orbital frontal cortex, and that's within the prefrontal uh, cortex. So that area had the, had the uh, strongest connections uh, with the amygdala, and also, and this is looking across individuals now, so th those with, e with stronger connections between um, the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala, they had less amygdala activation to threatening stimuli. So if you're an individual, you have really strong connections between the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala, you may not be, your amygdala may not be as responsive um, to threatening stimuli such as angry faces, threats, things like that. And so the idea here is that that may help individuals to regulate that initial amygdala response, and it may help them uh, be less prone to, to anxiety as well.
that, that makes sense? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so looking across individuals, so this is a study that Lee did with, what, 140 subjects? Okay, around there. So the individuals who had stronger white matter connectivity between this area right here, the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala, so some of them had really strong connections there, they had less amygdala activation to, uh, to a presentation of angry faces. And so the idea, I'll, just say, I'll get back to you, uh, the, the idea is that perhaps, and I'm just speculating here, but that may help them regulate uh, their response and it may help protect them from anxiety and we'll get to that in a little bit. So we hypothesized that growing up in poverty and this is, there's a lot of data on this, it's not us. Uh, growing up in poverty, you're at greater risk for have, to being exposed to a lot of, to more violence, uh, specifically more, uh, being the recipient of more abuse, uh, seeing more neighborhood violence on the one hand, but also uh, being exposed to more social deprivation as well, more neglect from the parents, uh, less positive uh, social interactions in your, in your environment. And then bringing in the brain, we hypothesize that if you, now there's going to be, a, these will relate to one another, but statistically we can separate them out in that the kids who are differentially or even more, have more exposed to more violence, they're going to show changes in amygdala function, and they're going to show uh, weakening of that amygdala orbital frontal cortex white matter uh, connectivity as well. And then the kids who get even more social deprivation, we're going to see effects on the nucleus accumbens, specifically just like we were talking about in the kids with neglect and depression. They have less nucleus accumbens activation in response to uh, rewarding stimuli. And then we uh, hypothesize that if you have greater amygdala activation and weaker connectivity between the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex, you're going to be more prone to anxiety. And if you have a reduced nucleus accumbens activation in turn related to social deprivation, you're going to be at increased risk for depression. So that is, these are the a priori hypotheses, and I'll show you the data in a little bit. Okay. Okay, so let me first show you some of the uh, demographics or subject characteristics of this sample. So um, the full sample, as I said, was 237, but depending on the, the, M, the MRI uh, procedure, we had good data from between 165 and 183. The um, age of these adolescents, but when we scanned them, was 15 to 17 years of age. By the way, they're about 18, 19 now. And um, one thing that we're particularly excited about is this is a majority African-American sample, so we have 68% of the sample is, uh, is African-American. Okay. All right, so now let's look at the uh, income. Um, okay, so there's a fairly broad distribution in the income uh, levels we see here, but it definitely skews towards the lower uh, end of the spectrum. In fact, 43% of this sample is at or below the poverty line. So the poverty line, if you haven't checked lately, is a little over $24,000 a year for a family of poor, excuse me, a family of four. So they're obviously really, really struggling uh, economically. So that's 43% of the sample that's, that's at or below the poverty line. And then the, the majority, the vast majority of these families are living at or, or below 200% of the poverty line, and so that's considered you know, still economically challenged. Okay, and so this is definitely uh, the saddest slide I'll be, I'll be showing this evening. Um, so these are national rates uh, for uh, different forms of, of maltreatment that are seen in the U.S., and the, this, these are the uh, rates that we see in this sample with the 237 and also just looking at kids with the good MRI data. Um, so across the board, the rates of maltreatment are, are much higher here than the national averages, and 46% uh, 
experient right here, 46% of this sample experienced some form of clinically significant maltreatment. So it's not just being spanked a couple times, it's, it's, it, the threshold is pretty high to be considered clinically significant. So this is a, yeah, definitely a challenge sample from this level too. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go on to psychopathology. First, I want to talk about the moms. So the focus, of course, is on the teens, but we're also really interested in how uh, the moms are doing. And so these are national rates, just focusing on women uh, and uh, common forms of psychopathology. So depression, PTSD in here. So the rates of, in particular, for depression and PTSD, uh, let me just say, point out this is lifetime. It's not that you currently have to have the disorder. At some point in your life, you had it. And most, what's Similar, most similar to that is this past. So at some point in your past, you had this form of psychopathology. And so for our sample, the rates of depression and PTSD are about tw uh, twice as high as, as the national averages. So they're doing worse, which is what you might expect considering the adversity they're going through. But they're still doing better than you might think. Oh, yeah. This category is unique for example, the national. If somebody's in the depression category, they're not going to be in the PS, PSD. Oh, so, yes, yeah, so that goes back to the comorbidity. So this could be, so the, for the national, so this, if you meet criteria for depression, you're marked there. If you meet criteria for PTSD, you're marked for that, too. So we're not, we're not ignoring one for the other. You can have comorbidity, and then that's represented here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, all right, so now let's turn uh, to the teens. So based on the fact that these kids are growing up in really high levels of poverty, they're experiencing a lot of maltreatment, and the moms are experiencing um, psychopathology, I would think that these rates in these adolescents at 15 to 17 would be remarkably high. And what we find, astonishingly, is that the rates really don't differ much from national averages. So. These are national averages of, say, depression, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, and this is what we see in the, uh, this sample for current and past. And so depression, for example, it's about the same in this sample as the, as the, as the national averages. And it's uh, actually GAD, sorry, generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD are actually lower. The one area where these teens are higher than national averages is ADHD. And so that's something we want to look at. Unfortunately, I can't discuss that more right now. We don't have data on it yet, but that's an area that we're interested in. But what's remarkable about this is that despite all this adversity, at least at between 15 and 17 years of age, they're, they're doing well right now. I mean, I would say this is a resilient sample, but of course, as time goes on, these rates on a national level will we'll go higher, and so you think that may happen with this, with this group as well. What's the bar chart to the right? It is, it's our data with the, and 237 families. It's not an experiment, but yeah, interviews with these families. I think this is from uh, this guy, Ron Kessler, who d has this big, big national study of thousands and thousands of individuals. And so his life has been creating representative samples to try to figure out what, like, what is the rate of depression? What is the rate of generalized anxiety disorder? No, so these are interviews. Yeah, so thanks for, these are not, and our data are based on interviews. And with the teenager, it's an interview. A this, it's called a structured interview uh, with the teenager and then also with the mom to, see, to try to you know, get confirmation on what's, what's going on to come up with a, uh, a, an official diagnosis. And they use some different procedures in, these, in this big national study. But essentially, it's the same. Their interviews are really, really hard studies to do. And now let's um, move on to the uh, brain imaging. So as probably most of you know, this is what an MRI looks like. As I was saying earlier, with uh, functional MRI and diffusion MRI, we can use this same machine. And uh, so just so you, let me just show you the setup for a functional MRI, because if you're in this 
you know, a big magnet like this inside this bore, people always ask, how the heck can you have them actually do one of these tasks they'll be showing you? And so fortunately, people have figured this out, and this is a, a common way that it's done. We do something similar to this, but we have subjects lying in the magnet. They're pressing a button here for if you're having them do a task with a button response. Then they have these prism glasses over their eyes, and then they can see the, uh, the video screen and then do the task that I'll be showing you here. Okay, so as I was mentioning, so we're really interested in responses to uh, faces, emotional faces, and so this is the task. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just tiny for you, but that's a neutral face being presented very briefly for just a quarter of a second. And then they press, sorry, they press a button to identify the gender because we want to make sure they're actually engaged in the task. I have a tendency to fall asleep in the MRI. We want to make sure that people aren't uh, doing that. We're able to get the, their brain response to the task and uh, so on and so forth. And they see, in this case, it's a sad face, briefly presented. They press the button indi indicating that's a male. And then again, there's a female presenting a happy face, and they identify the gender. And so we had different emotions presented. We had sad, happy, fearful, angry, and neutral faces all presented. Um, half of them were uh, African-American models. The other half were people of European descent. And we're really interested, and I'm going to illustrate this in a moment, we're really interested in not only amygdala function, but how amygdala activation changes over the course of what is a 14-minute task. So we looked at something called habituation. So, And I'll, I'll illustrate that for you in just a moment. And then also, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we're really interested in uh, nucleus accumbens activation as well, particularly to the happy or, or rewarding stimuli. OK, so they just. Uh, illustrate for you habituation. So you see this mildly scary face, and so the first time you see it, you show a really robust amygdala response to it. But over the course of seeing that face again, you know nothing terrible is going to happen to you, and so your amygdala habituates. So this is that's all I mean by habituation. So we look at amygdala activation in the first half and compare it to amygdala activation in the second half, as you'll see in a little bit to get amygdala habituation. Okay, so now let me just spend a little bit of time talking about how we looked at the environment uh, from this, the fragile families data. So these are data that were collected when these, uh, these youth, at this point adolescents, but this is, we got the data from the fragile family study when they were children. And this is uh, part of Tyler Hines' uh, dissertation right here. So she was really interested in looking at and how a lot of violence exposure, and on the other hand, how social deprivation relates to brain function. So some of this I kind of laid out, but I want to lay it out in more detail here for you. So she looked at, on, on the violence exposure side, looking, and this is back when the kids were three, five, and nine. She looked at uh, the amount of abuse that they experienced on the one hand, and then in terms of social support and social deprivation, she looked at whether or not there was neglect that these kids were experiencing. She also looked at, in terms of uh, violence exposure, intimate partner violence that the child may have been exposed to between the mother and uh, the boyfriend or the husband. And um, then in terms of social deprivation, the degree of partner support or lack thereof uh, with the mom. And then at the broader community level, in terms of violence exposure, she looked at uh, community violence uh, or neighborhood violence. And then uh, on the other hand, for social deprivation, she looked at the degree of community support that existed in that neighborhood at the time, or again, lack thereof. And so then uh, she related um, the degree of safety and violence exposure at these levels to amygdala activation in adolescents. And she related the degree of, of social support versus social deprivation in childhood to, uh, to nucleus accumbens activation. I'm going to show you one brain pick, and then I'm going to break it down because it's not, it's not very satisfying at first, but I, I, I find it satisfying later. <laughs> Okay, so this is a less than satisfying uh, picture. This is looking at, so the degree of, first of all, just childhood violence exposure uh, and adolescent amygdala function. So we see this uh, amygdala response here. 
and I'm gonna break it down for you in a moment, but just know that this activation, the degree of activation here relates to anxiety and depression symptoms. So it's not related to necessarily to disorders again, the rates of disorders were quite low, but we do see that this activation does relate to, um, to symptoms of both anxiety and depression. We hypothesize there'd be differentially anxiety, but we see it in both anxiety and depression. Okay, so let me break it down for you and show you what the habituation pattern um, looks like. So first I wanna show you this really nice habituation for um, when violence, ex for just looking at the teens who when they were children had really low levels of violence exposure. So in the first, and this is the amygdala response to angry faces. So the first half of the task is a really strong, robust amygdala response to these angry faces and then by the second half, it really dissipates. So you see a really nice amygdala response in these kids who didn't experience much uh, violence growing up. In contrast, here are the, here are the uh, teenagers who, when they were growing up, when they were kids, experienced high rates of violence exposure. And so what's remarkable here is we, don't, we see a really different pattern. We don't see that habituation at all. If anything, it goes up, but I have to say that's not statistically significant, but there's nothing close to a pattern of them habituating here. Not only are they not habituating, they're really, it's a pretty low activation. And um, so this, we have to investigate this a lot more, but this could be something to do with, uh, this could relate to the resilience we're seeing in the sample. They're just not responding more. And you're, you were alluding, if I understood you right, you were alluding to the idea that maybe they're seeing this so much in their natural environment, it's not a big deal. They've already habituated, and that, that potentially could be an element of what's going on here as well. Okay, so that's the amygdala. And this is, uh, the nucleus accumbens is much uh, simpler. So looking at childhood, degree of social depri deprivation, such as neglect, um, things of that nature, and then adolescent nucleus accumbens activation in response to happy, rewarding uh, faces, we see that the more social deprivation in childhood relates to less uh, nucleus accumbens uh, activation when they're, when they're teenagers. Okay, so this is going back to uh, more work um, by uh, Lee Gotchas. And so just to remind you, so she found that really uh, strong white matter, the strong white matter connections between this orbital frontal cortex right here uh, and the amygdala, and the stronger the connections, the less amygdala response we see. And so she's really, Lee was really interested in looking at how, if kids are growing up in really safe environments versus a lot of violence exposure. How did that relate to these white matter, this, uh, the white matter there? Or, and how did social support versus social deprivation, how did those environments relate uh, to white matter? And what she found was that both types, and I'm gonna illustrate this for you in a moment, uh, the graph that she created, um, both types were really important together. So let me just show you that. So she broke up the groups into those who had um, first, actually I have a hard time with the colors, but this is blue. So this is the um, kids who experienced a lot of uh, social deprivation in childhood. Um, and then looking at the white matter tracks in adolescence. So this is amygdala orbital frontal cortex white matter right here. And just at the kids who had a lot of social deprivation Right here on this axis is kids over here who had a lot of safe, experienced a lot of safety growing up, and then all the way out here, worse and worse, getting a lot more violence, are experiencing a lot more violence uh, growing up in childhood. So if you're unfortunate enough to have social deprivation, so a lot of parental neglect, not much social cohesion in the neighborhood or or uh, support in the in the family, then. The, across kids, the more violent exposure you're seeing, the less and less connectivity, white, sorry, white matter. <laughs> you see, you get less and less white matter, fewer and fewer white matter connections as the violent exposure gets worse and worse. Does that make sense? So I'll say it again. So yeah, you get that double hit, a lot of violent exposure, a, and social deprivation brings you over here where you have weaker white matter connections between the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala.
Yeah, so does the timing, the question is, is a good question, does the timing matter? And that's, yeah, I mean, that, we would think it does. We've not been able to look at that. So we've created these hypotheses before ex examining the data for a bunch of scientific reasons. But we'd love to then subsequently, and what we are doing is generating additional hypotheses about timing, like when would, when might the timing um, be at its worst or, or better? And yeah, that'd be something really interesting to look at, but we've not been able to do that to date. Um, okay, so this is the downside, and let me show you the more uh, promising part. So if instead of experiencing a lot of social deprivation in childhood, you experienced uh, a lot of social support, what you see is you see a very different pattern. As the violence get, gets worse and worse, it doesn't go down. Actually, it goes up. And I have to qualify that by saying that this, this slope, the slope going down, kids with social deprivation, that is a significant slope. They're, they're seeing significantly weaker white matter tracks um, the more violence exposure they have. But if, you ha if you're lucky enough to have a lot of social support going on, that buffers you. It's not, it's not that it's stronger, but it buffers you against getting more and more violence exposure so you don't see that weakening of, of the white matter connections there. Does that make sense? This is the toughest slide. <laughs> I practiced this. <laughs> All right, so let me, I, I have a revised model where I put this all together to try to clarify it further. So this is a revised model based on the data. Some of the hypotheses panned out, some did not. So let me just give you an updated version of the model. So we found that more violent exposures in childhood uh, related to reduced amygdala habituation in adolescence and that um, and amygdala activation in turn related not only to anxiety, but to anxiety and depression. And then the kids who are unfortunately were exposed to both violence exposure and social deprivation together, they showed a weakening of the white matter tracks connecting um, the amygdala and that and that structure in the prefrontal cortex, the orbitofrontal cortex. So together they see a weakening there. And then we know that the, the stronger, the weaker, I should say it this way, the weaker the connections here, the greater amygdala activation we see. And then in turn, greater amygdala activation, as I was saying before, that relates to anxiety. So you want to have strong, stronger connections here if possible. And then fortunately, if you have social support growing up at three, five, and nine, that's, Lee showed that that, related to greater con uh, white matter tract connections between the amygdala and the orbital, orbital frontal cortex. And that in turn can lead to a reduced activation of the amygdala with the potential that that may protect these subjects from, um, from these high rates of anxiety and depression. So going forward, we're really interested in trying to understand this and unpack this more. Because as I was saying, we haven't been able to break this up and look at the exact elements in terms of timing, but we also haven't been able to um, go back and develop and then test hypotheses on what it is about the social support. Is it uh, maternal so social support? Is it being uh, having a more cohesive neighborhood? things like that, is that helping and protecting these kids um, to be able to do better than they otherwise would be? Okay. And these are all the amazing people who worked on this um, study, the uh, investigators on this, Coulter, Nestor, and Luke Hyde. And this is Sarah McClanahan. She's at Princeton. She's the one that started the overall fragile family study. And these are all the amazing graduate students who collected uh, the data. I just want to highlight uh, Tyler, whose data I was, some data I showed you from her dissertation, and also uh, Lee Gotches, who collected or analyzed uh, the diffusion MRI data and the amygdala activation from that. All right. Thank you very much. This program was recorded on April 29, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.